Okay, welcome. So we're gonna be doing a q and I've got a bunch of my chisels and bench planes. I'm gonna do some sharpening while we do this because I might as well do something while I'm answering these questions. You guys sent me a lot of questions and I really appreciate that. I'm actually super excited about this. For those of you on YouTube have no idea uh, that this is happening, I filter these questions over on Instagram. So you might wanna go follow me on Instagram. I won't leave you high and dry though. If there's questions here that uh, don't cover your questions, we'll do another q and I will set you guys up and ask questions um, for my YouTubers, which I never wanna leave you guys high and dry. A lot of you guys follow me on Instagram, so it's kind of meshing and combining. Okay, so before we start fielding questions, I wanna tell you real quick about Muscox, who I partnered, with, partnered up with on this video. Uh, they are a very awesome uh, clothing company. Uh, they are providing a t-shirt. I'm gonna pick my favorite question. They're gonna get a t-shirt from Muscox, and I'm gonna throw in one of my t-shirts, so pretty cool giveaway. Uh, definitely go check out Muscox. There's a link in the description. Um, cool company. I'm very fortunate to get to work with them. Let's jump in and uh, start fielding some questions. I hope I can answer questions and um, sharpen chisels. We'll see. I'm, not, I'm a one track mind kind of man. Okay, I'm going to start off first question from Texas Brad at Texas Beard Adventures, who uh, is a buddy of mine. You've seen him in some of the other videos helping with the Argosy. And he asked, if you knew the Argosy build would take this long, would you buy it again? Yes, everything I do takes longer than I think it will, so I'm used to that. Um, so yeah, I would have bought it, no problem. He also asked, who's your favorite plumber? Brad, we all know you're my favorite plumber, man. I can't say that, I can't say anyone. I don't really know any other plumbers though, sorry dude. Stormy the Airstream uh, from Instagram, they asked, what's your favorite woodworking tool and why? That is a really good question. Hand tools. I would have to say my Stanley four and a half. Um, great, great all around hand plane. I use it all the time. This one's actually the first one I ever bought. And I, I, I really do pick this up all the time and use it. You can use it for a wide range of tasks. It's designed as a smoothing plane. Um, it was kind of a finished plane, but you can use it to joint boards. I can use it, you can use it on ingrain. Um, all kinds of little things, chamfer and edges. Uh, just a really good all-around plane. So I would say hand tool wise, that's my favorite tool. If we had to say favorite machine, obviously the big Oliver 36 inch bandsaw, which I love. Put a lot of love, a lot of blood, sweat and tears into that um, saw. So that'd be my favorite machine. Thanks for the question, Stormy the Airstream. Okay, next question. I hate freaking phones. Here we go. Comes from Cutting Edge Woodworking. How are you feeling mentally, physically through these tough times? Good question. Um, Really, I feel fine. I Physically, obviously, I'm, you know, I don't have any problems there. I've been very fortunate to be a pretty healthy guy. I think when you work with your hands and you your physical labor all day, you tend to be a, just a healthy individual all around physically. Now, mentally, I, yeah, I'm not worried. I'm not stressed. I, you know, my wife might argue differently about this, but I really don't try not to worry too much. Um, I mean, it's been tough. Business has slowed. YouTube revenue has gone down in my experience. Um, so money's tight and it's a little stressful and I wouldn't lie if I don't stress out some, but for the most part, I just men mentally I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, I think a lot of that comes from my Christian faith. You know, we're not, not to worry about things of the world. It's just not something that, uh, biblically we should do. So that keeps me pretty grounded, pretty level. Uh, I know there's a lot of hard times for other people. So, um, I hope people out there are doing the best they can. We've been fortunate not to be hit too hard and some people have no work lost their jobs so i my hats my heart goes out to those people i hope um they're able to get through it um and find their way through a good question thanks thanks for asking that appreciate it clem i can't pronounce the last name but i'm gonna say clem what motivated you to become a woodworker i think i uh was motivated from a very young age i just loved working with my hands i loved making things i remember making skate ramps as a kid um my dad had tools in his garage and so i would build stuff with my dad so I, it's just kind of ingrained in me, I want to say. I mean, I, I was just naturally motivated, so there wasn't a specific motivation. Um, I think the thing that really got me motivated to be a prof, uh, woodworker for a living as a profession was Paul Sellers. I took classes with him at Homestead, Homestead Heritage School of work, Woodworking in Waco, Texas, and um, spending a couple weeks in the shop with him, hearing how he approaches woodworking and his hand tool approach uh, pretty much got me hooked. I was... 23, 24 at the time, and it was had a huge impression on me. So that was a that was probably one of the main factors that got me into heading down the pathway of doing it uh, for a living. Good question, appreciate it. Philip, seven hundred and two. No, that's seven thousand and two. 
What was the very first piece you built? You, okay, well, what was the very first piece you built? Um, I built a table for myself when I was in college. It was a coffee table with all kinds. It made it out of two by fours, and I had no idea what grain orientation was and how wood moved, and I did it all wrong. And the thing basically broke apart, but it was the first thing I ever built. First real piece of furniture I ever made was a walnut rocking chair. Actually, it was a side table with Paul Sellers uh, at a walnut. Um, very simple design, tapered legs, um, arched apron. And then I, the, the first big piece was a walnut rocking chair, which I have in my bedroom. And the nightstands I actually use um, too. They're in my bedroom. Uh, but that walnut rocking chair, the thing that's so amazing about it is I did the entire thing with hand-cut uh, mortises. And they were, they were not, I mean, even the tenons were hand-cut. It was pretty sloppy. I was just learning. Joints definitely didn't fit tight. And that chair is still as solid as can be. So it kind of, I always think about that. It's like maybe we're all obsessing us furniture makers a little too much about the fit of our joints. Um, because that chair is pretty rough, and it's a rocking chair, and it does get used. And it's still holding together. Next question comes from Corey Kennedy. General business details, customers from online versus person, monthly sales quantity. Man, getting into the details. So, um, you know, since I brought in YouTube, my business has changed quite a bit. Uh, I've, sorry, I'm going to sharpen another chisel. I, so I, I do bring in a lot of online sales, um, but nothing really with furniture. I don't, I, I had, my ambition was to be able to sell furniture off my website, haven't really i've done it some i've probably sold five or six pieces that way a lot of the golf ball display cases get sold those get sold directly off my website and i've when i think about it now i've sold quite a few of those off the website but most of my furniture orders are coming locally uh here from where i live monthly the amount of monthly work i do i mean it it varies i could do depending on the work orders if i'm building a piece of furniture that's going to take up most of my month. You know, usually a furniture build's going to, a complex furniture build can, can take more than a month. So, um, you know, it just kind of depends. It varies a lot. Right now, this month, I'll probably do two work orders. I'll do, I've got a bench and a table to build, and then I'm finishing up some shelving. Um, so that's basically all I'll do on top of filming videos and making revenue through YouTube. So, uh, when you get into the real custom furniture work, they tend to, you know, there's a lot of hours in, in that. So uh, you're, you're not, the quantity is really not that high. Good question though. Okay, that's a good one. Christian P. Marcus asks best tips for a 17 year old who is just getting started in woodworking. I think the best thing I can tell a young kid who's getting started in woodworking is just be prepared to work. Work hard, pay your dues. Um, I spent probably 12, 13 years just either working for someone or teaching myself, grinding, trying to teach myself how to be a furniture maker. And it's just, that's what it takes. You, you got to pay your dues. It's, it's a craft. If you're staying true to the craft and you're building really well-made furniture that uh, you can put a lifetime guarantee on, then you need to be, be willing to uh, take the time to really learn, learn the craft. You know, don't be afraid to fail. You're going to mess up a lot. I've messed up so many times and don't allow emotions to get in there. The, discouragement i mean there's always going to be some discouragement but you're going to mess things up you're going to do things wrong you're going to have to start over on projects just get used to it you know i think that's what burns most people out is they expect they see someone who's a furniture maker in this digital world like me and they think i want to do that and they just think it's going to happen magically over the next course of a couple of years which you got to be prepared to work for it so that's what i'll tell you you know find hopefully find someone who's willing to take you under the wing and teach you some stuff get the tools you need to, to get in the shop and start building. And like I said, mess things up and learn from it, move on. And you do that long enough and you're going to become a really good furniture maker. So that's what I would tell a 17 year old work hard. Don't be afraid to fail. Okay. This is great. Patty Sabire. I, I'm going to scroll these up. Will you do more restoration type videos similar to the Argosy? I think I will. I think, uh, you know, my channel has kind of evolved, and I think a lot of YouTube channels do. I started off just doing silent carving videos, and um, I kind of just grew out of that. I don't know why. I, I 
I, I ran out of ideas and I was just having, I wanted to do more. I wanted to engage and with my audience and uh, I just wanted to try different stuff. So now I, I picked up this Argosy. I was really worried about how that would work with my audience. Like, well, this isn't going to be all woodworking. I wonder if people are going to like it. Seems like people have enjoyed the series. It's a whole different style. You know, I try to kind of do the quote unquote vlog, um, which I think is fun and enjoyable. Uh, hopefully my audience likes it. I think some people don't like it, but you can't please everyone. But yes, the answer, I'm going off on a tangent here. The answer is yes, I will be doing more restoration videos. I actually have, I'll just, I have a few in mind for when I'm done with the Argosy. One of which is converting a storage container into a really awesome second home or, or guest house. Other one is we need to redo the deck on our house and my wife is really wanted me to do that so that probably will be what i do uh and then we have some amazing amazing old live oak trees on our property and i think they one of them needs a really really cool tree house for my kids so those are the three that are kicking in my head and i'm definitely going to be um this chisel geez i'll have to redo that one i'm definitely going to be continuing uh those videos thanks for asking um do you have any big goals I'd like to see, hmm, this is a good question. I would love, I really, really, really want one day to have a shop, not here, but somewhere in town. We have a really cool main street. I always envisioned having a shop with a really cool showroom where people could come in, see the finished product, go in the shop, see it get built. That is, it's a goal that kind of comes and goes. Uh, there's times when I really feel driven to do it. And there's times when I know it'll be a huge headache and I don't know if I want to do it. Um, and I think, I think maybe one day, I feel like maybe one day it'll happen. We'll see. I also would love to see the channel grow. Uh, love to, love to hit a million subs. That would be really, really cool and a great accomplishment. So those are a couple big ones. This is a good one. Uh, don't know your call sign, but, did you start your woodworking business as a side job or did you go all in from the start? Uh, I started as a side job. It's going all in scary. I, uh, I was, we had, my wife and I were living in a little 1200 square foot house here in Bernie in town. I worked out of my garage and I was working for a door maker for three years. And he, I started that job kind of under the agreement that I would, um, I would probably go off on my own. So we, uh, we had that agreement going and I was getting side jobs. So I would work for him during the day and I'd go work at night and the weekends in my garage in my shop. And eventually I got to the point where I was like, you either got to go or no. I mean, you can't keep doing that. I started building a little bit of a name for myself and he was okay with it. My boss and I jumped in and then I jumped in. but I did pick up some side jobs. I didn't just stop with no work and go into my own business. I had side jobs and I gradually worked into it. I think that's a great way to do it. First ever project I made, we kind of went over this one already and they want to know if I have a photo of it. I do. I'll put a photo of it right here so you guys can see it. It's the Walnut Rocker. I'm, I'm using that one as my first because it's the first one I really, really was really proud of. So there it is. DS Woodcraft. Any new tools you're looking to get? I, this is not woodworking tool, but I really do want to get a welder. I want to learn how to weld. Um, I just haven't really wanted to pull the trigger. Uh, as far as woodworking tools, I really want to replace this bandsaw. And then the joiner planer is, I have a combo machine. It's a jet joiner planer. It needs to be replaced badly. So I'm in desperate need of a new joiner, pretty much a new planer, but I really want another combo machine. Um, and I'm, it's kind of it's kind of bad timing because it's not the best time to be buying equipment because, like I said, business is a little slow, cash is a little tight. But those are the two. Really, if I had to say what is the machine I'm, I'm looking for, it would be the joiner. Replace the joiner planer. Which I think there's going to come a point where I'm not going to have a choice because it's like it's going to break down on me. Z Zakhar Banikov, this is a really good question and might take a while and I probably won't give you a very quick rundown. Hi, from couple posts I've seen, you seem to be a Christian. You are correct. Can you share your testimony? So I'll try to share it fast because it's a long testimony. Maybe I'll make it long, but uh, I was 
raised in a Christian home, awesome Christian parents, really good Christian dad, became a Christian at age eight through my own doing. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't something that was pushed on me. I, uh, I didn't fully understand what being a Christian was at the time, but uh, I was baptized um, in Fort Worth, Texas at Travis Avenue, ba- Travis Avenue Baptist Church by Joel Gregory. Um, went to, you know, kind of fell away from it my teenage and college years, really completely fell away from it. Kind of turned to the world, thought the world was way more fun. Uh, I didn't understand Christianity like I mentioned, and I, I just felt like I was always being, I was always wrong. I always felt like I was doing the wrong thing and being bad, and it was just this very legalistic mentality. Went through that phase through most of my 20s into my mid-20s, and um, I had some very impactful moments. This is, it's, the, the furniture is all intertwined into to all my testimony, but um, so mid-20s start, you know, I'm starting to kind of, Go back to church and picking up my Bible, reading it. I'm really starting to understand um, the gospel a lot better, and that grace is freely given, and that you know we can't work our way into heaven. It's that's not how it works, and that's kind of, I think, kind of where my mind was for a while. Um, had a very close incident, uh, incidents where I felt God spoke to me. I felt He put me on the path to being a furniture maker, and. Um, really pulled me away from the way I was living, uh, chasing things of the world. So uh, that is a very brief and lack of details of my testimony. There's a lot more to it, but um, yeah, that's basically my road to Christianity. Okay. Would you ever teach a woodworking class? Yeah. Uh, I've never really felt like I'm great at teaching. Um, It's not my, really the thing that I am good at. Uh, but I would do it. I would definitely do it. I, the opportunity has been there. I've had Woodcraft in San Antonio kind of reach out to me, and uh, I just haven't been very proactive. And then the Austin School of Woodworking, there was some talk of me teaching there, and I just, I don't know. You know, I you can't bite off more than you can chew, and I, I tend to do that. So this stage in my career, uh, my teaching is happening through my videos, not through one-on-one classroom teaching. Okay, moving on. Got some fresh coffee here. Hot coffee on a hot afternoon. Tasty. Uh, next question. Snooze King. Can I have you old electronics? Don't know what that's all about. We'll skip that. This question says, what type of finish would you use for cooking utensils? I use mineral oil. It's pretty easy. You can also use wax. I think people use beeswax. There's a lot of different food safe finishes. For cooking utensils, mineral oil, um, super easy to reapply. You can also use coconut oil. Um, That's what I use. What's the best chisel for the money? Um, These blue handle marples or Irwins, I've had these my whole career basically. These are the first set I got. Um, I think you can get these on Amazon. In fact, I can link that in the description. Good steel, good chisels. If you want to spend big money and get a really good, well-made, beautiful chisel, Lee Nelson is the next way to go, in my opinion. Tips. This comes from Krauth Furniture. Tips for someone trying to step up the quality of their pieces. Hmm. I think one thing that, you know, you have the technical side and the design side. These are two very important components. I used to think that the technical, the craftsman, the, the workmanship, the building was more important than design, but I've started to kind of fall into the they're equal because you can build something really well and execute it perfectly if the design sucks, then you're obviously it's not a great piece of furniture. So you can work on your design. Um, that's something that I think is fairly easy to improve quicker than your fundamentals and your skills. That just takes time and practice. Uh, one book that's helped me is by Hand and Eye. It's basically talks about the whole whole ratio of proportions and how they pertain to furniture and design. I mean, it, traditional furniture before we had all this CAD and all this stuff was just drawn up in proportions, basically. I mean, you can find all these hidden proportions within old pieces of furniture. And if you stay within those proportions, ideally your furniture comes out looking really balanced and nice Um, so that would be one thing i mean improving your understanding of design will probably improve the quality of your furniture Uh, most people who want to build furniture can handle learning the technical side 
right? We can master that. We can learn how to cut mortises and we can get good at that. Learning how to turn that into an aesthetically pleasing piece of furniture is, is hard and I struggle with it. I, I, don't, I wouldn't by any means call myself a great designer. Uh, there's a rare breed of furniture makers that they're really good furniture makers and um, equally as good designers. I look up to those people. I don't think I'll ever be that, but uh, I do the best that I can. Um, and so I think if you're looking to up your game, then uh, try to tweak your design a little bit. I mean, you can just continue mastering the, the technical side, but uh, getting a better understanding of design will help. Uh, when did you start? I did a few years ago and I'm 13. Well, you're off to a great start. This is from John Martinez, 2018. Being 13 and knowing that you enjoy building furniture, that's something you want to do, my hat's off to you. You're on a good start. I started taking it very seriously at 23, 24, so you're ahead of the game. Keep it up. Who taught you and how long does it take to learn? Well, I've touched on this as well. I mean, I got a mix of teaching from uh, Paul Sellers, Frank Straza, both of which I learned from at uh, Homestead Heritage School of Woodworking. And I did a brief apprenticeship with Brian Boggs in Kentucky. Got a lot out of that. Very, very talented furniture maker. And then I taught myself a lot. And then I worked under Brent Catterton at Brent Catterton Woodworks here locally. Also, very talented craftsman. Learned a whole lot from him. That was really where I got comfortable with, um, really found my comfort zone and being able to build furniture. How do I keep my woodworking business running strong? I have learned in the years of my business, I started my business in 2012, uh, so I haven't really been doing it that long. Um, but I have learned that as long as you do the best work that you can do, people and, and your customers are satisfied. Uh, that's how you keep your business going strong. I mean, if I'm putting out work and people aren't happy and satisfied, your business is going to fail. If I'm putting out work and people are happy with it, I'm going to keep getting more work. It's going to keep coming. It's going to have a snowball effect. So... Um, Basically, just do the best work you can do. Always put out the best you can do. Always make sure your customers are happy with the end result. You, you never want to hand a piece over in a customer and not feel like it was your best work and not feel like a customer really likes it. That, that's, that's bad news. This is from Lucky Todd. Hi, I'm trying to find a shop where I can work, but it's really hard to find something, especially in town. Okay, there's no question there, dude, unless I'm missing something. Um, well, I'll just touch on this real quick. Most, a lot of the furniture makers I know that are one-man shops work on shops in their property because rent is too high. Overhead kills you. So that's a quick touch on that. What's your favorite hand tool? I've already talked four and a half Stanley. Got two of them sitting right here. By far my favorite. And I like my draw knives. Those are really fun to work with. Draw knives are a lot of fun. South Coast Dad. I know this guy. He is, um... He sent me some messages before, super cool guy. After a saw, bench plane, chisel, and measuring tools, what's the next tool to add? Um, spoke shave, maybe? I have four, I use them a lot. I actually have probably six, there's a couple in my tool chest. Spoke shave is a great tool for curved sections. Anything curved, spoke shave does great work with. This is a wooden spoke shave with a low angle. It can take a really heavy cut, so I'll, I'll set this for my heavy cuts, and then I've got a flat bottom sold spoke shave that'll do flat work, and it'll do curved work if the radius isn't too big. This is a radius sole, so this is good for getting into curves. Really cool little hand plane, or hand plane, spoke shave. And then this has got the curved sole, so it'll, it's great for shaping chair spindles. That's primarily what I got it for, chair parts. So add yourself some spoke shaves. What tool, this comes from Matt, Matt34, what tool did you wish you had known about earlier when you were just starting? That is a good question, and I think I would answer that by saying my dividers. Uh, I love these. I use them a lot, and I had no idea what these were for when I first started. Uh, but they, they make laying out dovetails really easy, dividing out any spacing super easy. Uh, you can get them in all different sizes, and I just think they're really cool. So that would be what I wish I knew about. Good question. This is a good one. Net, Nate, Naf, no, something clinch. If you could take one tool to survive and build on a desert island, what, what would it be? I think the best tool for, an, for a desert island would be an axe. You can do so much with an axe or a hatchet. Uh, you can build structure. You can make things. You can kill animals if you need to eat. So I'm taking an axe with me. Or am I, well, no, I'm taking an axe.
definitely. Share some ideas about the woodworking for the Argosy. Oh, I look forward to the interior videos. I wish I could. I want to keep that a little bit more of a secret. I do have some great ideas, and there's going to be a lot of veneer work, I think. Um, and talking about doing some, thinking about doing some hanging uh, bunk beds and kind of just some really off the wall stuff. But I don't want to give all that away. So good question, but you're going to have to wait on that. Johnny Jack Mercer, do you have a favorite handmade piece that was gifted to you? I wish I could say yes. I can't think of anything that um, was gifted to me. Somebody please give me a nice piece of furniture. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, uh, I've never been gifted a piece of furniture. You know what? I'll strike that. We weren't gifted it, but we got my wife's uncle's old chest of drawers and we use it in our bedroom and it is old and it was definitely handmade. It is hand cut dovetail. So very cool piece. Um, I wouldn't say it was gifted to me, but it's a cool piece. Thank you for helping me stay alive. Well, I hope that's not the truth, man, but I um, hope you're doing all right there. How do you determine the price of your work? Sorry, I had to get some coffee before that one. It's, oh, excuse me. It's really a basic formula. I think a lot of guys go by this formula. Basically, you're taking material costs, uh, hours times your shop rate, adding those together, and you get your your cost of your piece. Shop rate is basically what it costs for me to keep this place operating, all the overhead, um, and my salary, what I need to make to provide for my family. Roll that in, divide it all up until you get um, an hourly rate. That gets multiplied by how many hours I think it'll take to build something, uh, which is the tricky part because you're kind of having to, every piece is custom, you're kind of having to almost, there's an educated guess to it. You get better the more you do it. And then I take my material cost, which is the easy thing to figure out. You can figure out material pretty easily. I always uh, mark it up 30%, um, sometimes more depending on the material. That usually is not profit. That usually gets eaten up uh, some, in some way by the time it takes to handle the material or go pick it up or all that stuff. I have to fill cracks or just things like that. So that is my general um, formula. Material marked up 30%, uh, hours multipl multiplied by shop rate. Add those two together, and you've got the cost of your piece. How long did it take you to grow your business? Uh, started in, it. I would say the, the after about five years, I really had my feet on the ground and felt like uh, I was doing pretty well. So I was kind of this. I never advertised. It was all kind of a snowball effect that took about four to five years to really get to where I needed it to be. This is from Axel 2000 Rodriguez. I make pine tables. I usually glue the top to the base. Am I in the wrong? Can I get away with that? No, Axel, you should not be gluing the tabletops to your bases. Wood floats and moves. It takes on moisture from the atmosphere and it goes away. It changes in humidity. So if you lock it in place, it's going to find a way to move and it's gonna fail at some point. It's gonna crack. So I would recommend you attaching your tabletops in a way that they can move and float with the changing humidity. This comes from Derek Moen Woodworking. Do you feel God's pleasure when you woodwork? Like Eric Riddle when he runs. I don't know who Eric Little is. Maybe I should, but of course I do. I mean, as a Christian, um, I think our work pleases God. I think God is our creator. He created us. And I think God put us here to do work. It glorifies God. I think our work needs to be done in a way that is glorifying to God. I, I often will pray in the mornings before I get to work, before I get started with work, and one of the things I almost always say is that I, I pray that my day would, my actions and my work would glorify God because it's so easy, and I'm very guilty of this. It's my temperament to get very frustrated uh, when things aren't going well and start just kind of acting like an idiot, uh, saying bad words, throwing things. So that kind of work, that's not glorifying God. I want to um, enjoy my work, and in doing so, I think that glorifies God. So yes, that is a good question. What outdoor activities do you enjoy doing? Um, how did I miss that one? That's a good question. Uh, one of my favorite things to do that I don't get to do enough is fly fishing. I did it a ton as a young man. Uh, and now that I took on the, the, the woodworking business and all that, I've done way less. But it is something I really enjoy um, doing quite a bit. So that would be one of my outdoor activities. Uh, hiking with the family. I love getting out and taking the family on hikes. 
This question uh, says, what kind of saws do you use to cut dovetails? Well, there's a, sp a specific saw for dovetails called a dovetail saw. It's got a real fine tooth pattern. Uh, you can get them at Lee Nielsen, Veritas, um, Bad Axe, I think is it saw. There's, there's a lot of saw makers. You can get them um, from, you can get old ones too, antique ones. So uh, dovetail saw is what you're looking for there. Jonas Grotzinger, can't pronounce your name, sorry. Do you think you'd have to build more furniture if you weren't successful at YouTube? Yeah, so yeah, this is a good question. Um, right now, as it is, it's probably 50-50 revenue split between the furniture business and the YouTube. Two years ago or a year and a half ago, YouTube was doing much better than it is now, and I was more like 70-30 probably, uh, YouTube revenue. The thing about YouTube is it's so incredibly unpredictable. One month will be amazing, the next month will be horrible. So it's just so up and down. I, I've worked so, I worked so hard to start this business, and it's it, it was a dream of mine. You know, it's like I, I when I was 24, I dreamed of this of running a furniture business, and I just can't see myself giving that up to just start making videos. Plus, I think YouTube's super unpredictable, and long term, it's not realistic to put all my eggs in that basket. So. I will always run my furniture business and try to mesh the YouTube into that. That'll be my first priority. Then YouTube comes in. Uh, that's all. That's just how I operate. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's 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 Andy's way. Um, where is the first place you will go with the RXC when it's all done? That's a good question. Don't know yet. I know for facts. I'm turning 40 next year. I will be going to Yellowstone. I worked in Yellowstone for a while in my 20s, and I love the park. So I know Emily uh, wants to take the family there, and I think that's a trip we're going to take the RV on. As far as the first one, it's undecided at this point. A lot of uh, several companies have really helped by sponsoring the videos. One of one of which is Total Boat. They have uh, headquarters out somewhere on the East Coast, and I think we've I've talked to them about going out there, and that's a possibility. But we we don't know yet. We'll find that out and hopefully do something really cool. Will Hode, would you be interested in taking on another vintage trailer project, my Spartan? Well, Will, I would be interested. I think it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. And if someone wants to pay me to restore uh, their vintage trailer, uh, I'm on board. So, so shoot me an email. Hippie Gregory, what tools are good first buys for a beginner woodworker? So if you're talking about machines, um, table saw, planer joiner, um, bandsaw, little 14 inch bandsaw are good starting machines. If you have a very low budget, get yourself a plunge router. That You can do so much with a plunge router and table saw. Um, hand tool wise, the Stanley 4.5 is the, the, a great starter plane, a set of bench chisels, and some layout tools, marking gauges, and a, adjustable stair. Did your C channel have any rust on them? Okay, so C channel is what hooks the shell. It hooks to the subfloor of my Airstream, and the shell hooks to that. It's a very important component. Um, did not have rust on it because it's aluminum. Uh, but it was in really bad shape. It had, uh, it, in areas where it had become in direct contact with metal, it corroded through that process of electrolysis. So it was, it was pretty corroded and torn up, um, but not rusted. The best way to start learning woodworking, the first thing you need to do is you need to learn the, fundam the fundamentals, the techniques. Um, you want to make sure you learn them correctly. So you can take classes. I'm, there's a lot of different areas. Uh, there's schools devoted to furniture making. There's community colleges. You can probably find your community some sort of area where you can find classes, maybe even a woodworking club. Uh, Woodcrafts sometimes have uh, classes. And then once you learn those basics, I mean, there's all, so much you can catch on the Internet, so be real careful of it. But if I had to push you in a direction for someone to learn off of the Internet, I would say Paul Sellers, um, great channel for learning. Yeah, I would say learn the fundamentals and just practice, 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 build, you know, make things. And you'll come across challenges. And when you get to a point where you don't really know what to do, try to figure it out. You can search it online. Just be careful what information you're getting. This question is Black, black Tin Barge. If you didn't get into woodworking, what could you see yourself doing instead? That's a good question. I, I love the, the video production stuff. I think it's fun. I could see myself making documentaries. I think that's something I've always uh, kind of had an eye for and enjoyed. Um, uh, outside of that, I, I could see myself being a fly fishing guide, but I don't, don't, think, that would, don't think that would support the family. Maybe it would. Uh, but that's, yeah, I think I'd probably do something in the area of filmmaking. 
How do you start off your wood sharp? Okay, so specifically the wood shop, I started, the first place I had was a corner of a warehouse. It was like a thousand square foot warehouse. It was a family friend and he just let me have the corner. I think I paid a couple hundred dollars a month for it. I don't think I paid for it actually. That didn't last long because he sold the building. Then I went into my house, the two car garage in my house. Uh, did that for a little while, started my business there. Then I found an 800 square foot building in Bernie, like in the main part of Bernie, which is a really cool location, just kind of not a great building. I paid $300 a month and I worked there for three and a half, four years. And then the business had kind of started to grow, started to grow to the point where uh, I needed the space and new machinery. And so we bought this property and this building was put on it. So that is, those are the kind of how I got to this point in the workshops I've worked in. Okay, this comes from Classic Classic Nathan B, do you prefer doing the work or making the videos? Does filming take away any of the joy of the work? That's a great question. It does take away the joy. It's it's challenging to film it. And when you're when you're being paid to make these pieces, the clients are expecting a really nice piece of furniture and you want to produce a really nice piece of furniture, bringing the camera in can be a bit stressful and tough. That's why when you see me build uh, a big piece, so like a two-part video series, like recently I did the Nakashima table for a client, you won't see me talking to the camera, interacting with the camera like I do on my, my Argosyville uh, videos uh, because that just takes too much thinking, takes too much strategizing. I don't want to have to do that. I just want to move the camera around and catch catch the different angles, catch the work, and then come back and voice it over. So that's how why I operate that way. It's the way I will always operate. Um, it's really challenging because you, you know, YouTube is this place where you can start it's so tempting to start reaching for views and getting kind of clickbaity for views and building things that are reaching for views and kind of clickbaity. And I've been guilty of it, but I try really hard to not to stay in my lane. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just want to do my thing. I want to showcase my furniture. I want to show people craft furniture, the craft of furniture making with my channel. And I want to try to do that in an entertaining way. So I'm going to stay in that lane and do that. For a long time, I only did the quiet videos because you don't have to worry about the dialogue or talking to the camera. I, I will not build a piece for a client and you will not have me talking to the camera and doing that because I don't want to think about that. I just want to move the camera and get the angles and then come back and voice it over for you guys. That's typically how I'll do it. Tobacco wood, tobacco road woodwork, woodcraft. Um, how long did you wood, woodwork before feeling confident to build the expensive with the expensive woods? I don't think that... I mean, before I felt confident to build pieces for people, I, I probably was doing it for five or six years. Um, but I worked with expensive woods right off the bat. I didn't really, I didn't let that, I've never really worked with horribly expensive woods, I should say, like exotics. I never, I don't even do that now, really. When you look at the, the business of furniture making, the cost is in the labor, not the wood majority, unless you're working with some insanely expensive woods, but... Um, for the most part, the cost is in the labor. So you be, I'm more, I get more stressed out about losing the time. So if I've spent two or three out, two or three days building something. So if I spent two or three days building something and something goes wrong and I have to go buy more lumber, I don't really fret about buying the lumber. I kind of more like, man, I just lost two or three days worth of shop time. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, T.A. Sutton, what core techniques, if any, as a beginner, would be you recommend perfecting before progressing on? You know, there's so many different aspects of woodworking. I don't know which one to focus in on but and which one would help you personally. But I would say, like, if you're cutting dovetails, your core technique that you need to get is getting your saw straight and sawing straight to your line. That's a huge one, and that kind of goes across all joinery. If you're cutting it by hand, sawing to your line. That takes practice. So that would be a great technique to master. Um, hand planing a flat surface without, you know, if you're edge joining without getting it um, off 90, that's a good technique to practice. And you're going to achieve that by watching your shavings come out of your plane to make sure that they're equal across the width of that piece. Uh, so those are a couple that are off the top of my head. I don't know how helpful that is. Uh, there's a lot of core techniques um, from anywhere from the machinery use into the hand tools. Matty Bulge 98. Uh, what is your favorite hand tool you own? I think I've got a couple. Let me see. These are the Lee Nielsen Bog Shaves. So I worked with Brian Boggs and he designed these. And he, I did a brief apprenticeship, but when I left, he engraved on one of these chip breakers. And let me see if this is the one. Nope. While I drop the blade, it's not exactly what you want to do. It'll be on this one. He engraved Focus. 
and on the chip breaker, which I think is super cool, really cool personal touch, which makes this probably one of my more favorite tools. I'll show that to you right there. I didn't even know he did it. I got home uh, back from to Texas, unpacked my tools and was using it and found that and was just like, that's super cool. You know, I look up to Brian and to have his, to have that engraved on a tool uh, will, means a lot to me. So I would mark it as this spoke shave with a, engraved by Brian Boggs. Go to finish and technique to apply it. Well, um, my go to really is pre catalyzed lacquer from Sherwin Williams. Um, I'm actually spraying some right now on some walnut shelving. I've got it sitting outside uh, and I, I spray it. Uh, I, I keep it in the vise. But this is my, it's a Fuji um, MXP30 HVLP sprayer. Uh, and the reason I, that's my go to finish is because it's quick and easy. I mean, you can spray lacquer on three coats real quick, it dries fast. Uh, and it's super protective. So I can get through a finish really quick uh, with that technique and get a really nice, pretty finish. A lot of times I'll use oil um, and conversion varnishes if I need the durability, but my go-to finish is the pre-cat lacquer from Sherwin-Williams. Millennials can't do math. That's kind of funny. Where do you find old wood machines? It's, I mean, you just kind of keep your eye open for them. I, the, the bandsaw, I was a friend of mine told me about it. He just said, hey, I know this guy's trying to get rid of a bandsaw. The mortiser I got off eBay, Craigslist, um, is I've found machines there that I haven't bought, but you can find them on Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, um, online um, auctions, uh, IRS machinery, places like that. Uh, you really just kind of, it's a wide range of places you can find these machines. Sometimes it's just about being in the right place at the right time. What's your favorite piece you've made that didn't get a video? That's a good question. I don't know if I know answer that off the top of my head. I built a custom photo booth for a client. This is before I even started YouTube. This is right when I started my business. And uh, it's, it was really, it's really probably one of my top pieces. It was just really interesting how the doors opened. They slid back. There was a camera hidden in it. There was lights in it. Uh, it had a built-in like system for curtains. And it was, it was really pretty cool. So... That may be uh, the one that's coming to me right now. Maybe, maybe it. I'm thinking about getting into hand tools. Which ones would you recommend? You know, I think you the Stanley four and a half is the the best starting plane. I would recommend that. Some marking gauges, uh, a combination square, and chisels instead of bench chisels. That's a good start. And these these you can get these on Amazon. These are good. These little blue handles are good to get. Next question, Chase and Tight Lines. I like that. That sounds like a fly fisherman. Biggest advice for someone about to go full-time woodworking and leaving the salary job? Well, first off, congratulations. I think you're making an awesome move. Wish, wish you the best of luck. Um, the best advice I can give you is always produce the best work you can possibly produce. Uh, and it's going to be hard in the beginning because you're going you're gonna to miss bid some jobs. You're going to bid some jobs low to get the jobs. You're not going to come in uh with n without having a big p portfolio and and be the top price right you can't expect that um so you always want to put out the best product and here's why so when i first started let's say you bid a table uh dining room table at 40 hours to build it it ends up taking you 60 70 hours well that's a big miss you're, you're gonna lose a little you're not gonna lose money but you're you're gonna work for a minimal amount of money to build that table you know once you realize that you're taking longer than you expected the, your gut feeling is going to want to be to rush it and just get it done. Don't let that happen. You just got to eat that cost and build the best you can build. And, and the reason why is because when you put that piece in that person's house, they're expecting the best you can build. So, you know, that's what, that's what you want to give them. And they become, that piece becomes your marketing. You're, they become sales reps for you. So anyone who's building a, anyone who's buying a handcrafted piece of furniture is going to want to invite people over and have them eat on it and, and share it with people. And people are going to see it and be like, oh, that's a beautiful table. How'd you get, where'd you get that? And they're going to want to tell them about it. And so now they're selling to other people. Well, you do that, you get 12 or 20 of those pieces out into homes. It'll start to snowball pretty quick. And this is exactly how it worked for me. Um, it was probably a two or three year process, but it started to build and it got to the point where I didn't have to reach out to get the work. People knew who I was. I built a name for myself. So if you're not putting out the best work you can, you're putting out mediocre work and that's not going to sell itself like it should. So just put out the best work you can possibly put out. And uh, I promise you, it'll slowly start to snowball. And if you're doing good work, uh, it will pay off. You will start to get clientele. 
Okay, moving on to CW Glover. Which which other makers inspire you? I like this question. Um, well, Brian Boggs, obviously I worked for him. Um, Curtis Buchanan's a Windsor chair maker. I love his work. Um, man, there's so many, and I'm not going to think of them all. Uh, I've just went to grab this. This is Mike Pekovich's book. Mike Pekovich is someone who inspire, inspires me, a great furniture maker. Uh, Clark Kellogg out of Houston. Uh, I look up to him. Philip Morley, another great furniture maker. These are Those are a couple Texas furniture makers. Um, I've always loved Thomas Moser's work. He scaled his business in a way, but it's still really well-made furniture. Uh, and I think his designs are just really timeless and, and quite nice. So uh, those are a few that inspire me. Uh, there's probably a lot more. I'm just not, they're not popping up in my head, but that's a good question. Appreciate you asking that. What is your future plans for your business? Any changes in direction? Magnus from Sweden. Thanks, Magnus from Sweden. Great question. Um, you know, I really wanted to scale my business and kind of create a handcrafted production line. I struggled to do that. I've been trying to do that for a couple of years and um, I wouldn't say I've failed, but I have not succeeded. I think in large part due to the fact that I don't really have the business aptitude to pull that off. Well, I'd say I don't. I probably do, but I, uh, I, feel, like, I feel like it's just a, a huge mountain to climb, and I haven't been able to figure out how to do it. I've always wanted to see having a shop with uh, a small amount of workforce, a showroom built into it where people can come in, see the finished product, and then see how it's made. I think that's super cool. Uh, it's always kind of been a dream of mine. I, I hope one day maybe I can achieve it. Changes in directions, you know, I don't, I don't foresee any changes in directions right now. I think with YouTube, it's, it's really hard to know where you're going to be because YouTube can start to open a lot of doors. If my channel, uh, you know, grows, it's, it's kind of on a slow growth path right now, but I think, I'm, I'm sure it will continue to grow and um, who knows what doors are going to open from that. So uh, I kind of, um, right now I'm focused in on one-off custom pieces and creating content for you guys and, you know, where that leads me in five years, uh, I'm excited to find out. We'll see. What kind of window seam sealer did you end up using? Well, so for the window to the aluminum sash, I used an aluminum silicone from CRL which has worked really quite nicely. I, I've had no leaks and it's gotten rained on. From the sash to the shell, I used Total Boat's aluminum sealer, which also was working really well. Um, so those are the two main sealers. I did put, on all the glass I took out of the windows, I did put a, um, don't have it in front of me, but a glazing, rubber glazing. So there's basically two layers of sealing. There's a silicone and there's the rubber glazing. Uh, the thing, The tricky thing about the aluminum sash is it doesn't always fit the curves of the window perfectly, so you'll have tight spots and loose spots. Uh, so you, it's really hard to depend on that glazing. So the silicone is kind of your main main barrier. Uh, so far, so good. But obviously, we got some. We'll find out in the future how all that works. Corey Vogues, have you always done this, or what did you do before woodwork? Good question. So I went to school, um, studied telecommunications at Baylor University, and that's, uh, well, actually started, I guess I should say I started in the business school, got to like a year and a half into that, got to QBA 2 and accounting 2 and just hated it. I hated the numbers. I wasn't any good at it. So I switched over to telecom, which is kind of a combination of video production, radio, um, website, graphic design, kind of all bundled in uh, together. It was a lot different. I mean, this was 2003, 2004, so it's changed a lot. Um, now, but well, when I graduated, I did, I pretty much went right into wanting to be a furniture maker. I did a little bit briefly with the, with the video work, um, went into a cabinet shop. I basically moved back to with my parents, worked at a cabinet shop, got the apprenticeship, worked at Brian Boggs shop, came back, um, kind of worked on my own for a while, trying to start a business, but it was too early. Worked for an arborist in Waco, um, also worked for a granite shop, cutting granite countertops, which was miserable. Um, and then I worked here in Bernie when I moved here for a door maker for a while. So I had a wide range, but um, the jobs I had before I was woodworking mainly were arborist and granite, fab granite countertop fabrication, uh, which I'm glad I did not continue that road. Last question coming from Ryan Kilo. Now, Ryan's a bit of a jokester. Ryan, 
Ryan is actually... Okay, last question coming from Ryan Kayla. Now, Ryan actually worked for me. He's been in some of the YouTube videos, early videos, um, and he's a bit of a jokester. And here's his question. Yes, I would like to know how many games of hatchet throwing you have lost to Ryan Kilo. Well, Ryan, I would probably guess that I've lost every game to you because I'm not very good at hatchet throwing. Either that or you're really good at hatchet throwing, but you beat me every time, I will admit that. My question to you, Ryan, is how many games of horse did you lose to me in here in the shop? I actually still have the score tallied up, and it looks like I was five, six, seven. It looks like I was nine games ahead of you, so... You may have been good at hatches, but you weren't so good at shooting hoops, man. Great question, though, man. Appreciate it. Everyone, you should check out Ryan's Instagram, uh, Ryan Kilo, if you want to. He doesn't post a lot because he's kind of a non-digital age kind of guy, which I like about Ryan. Uh, but good guy. Appreciate the question, Ryan. I hope you're doing well. So before we leave the T-shirt giveaway, I randomly selected one of the questionnaires. Uh, I thought that was the best way to do it. And I picked C.W. Glover. So... Um, Hey, man, if you watched this and saw this, shoot me a message on Instagram or an email to andy at andyrolls.com with your address and T-shirt size. And we'll get you a Muskox T-shirt and one of my shirts. Uh, and if I don't hear from you, I'll try to reach out to you. Um, thanks for the question. Thank you to everyone for all your questions. Appreciate you guys watching the channel, supporting the channel. Uh, means a lot to me. And uh, hopefully you guys got something out of this. So um, we will uh, hopefully do another one next month maybe. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you next time.